The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Are you ready? I think I picked one. The pitfall of an independent self. The pitfall of being an independent self. All right, and if you don't like that one, um, <laughs> well, then I had the other title too, the, the Replaced Life and How to Walk It Out. And then if you don't like that one, I have a third title, Forgive One, Two, Three. That's our website, by the way. That should be the easiest thing to remember. And basically, Jennifer came up with that after she put all of her training and all of her teaching on a shelf and said, I think what you're teaching is very simple. I think it's easier than everything I've ever learned. <gasps> and so it was a return to the simplicity that's in Jesus. Um, I purposely, for Kingdom Life people, you're gonna be a people helper. You need to be able to help people uh, that struggle but <clears throat> we do not, there are plenty of Christians who love the Lord and are sincere, but their mind has been corrupted from the simplicity that's in Jesus. We have a tendency, we have a capacity in our flesh to make things harder than they really are. As a matter of fact, even secular science will tell you that you have a capacity, like in the case of a, what you would call a trauma or a traumatic event, you have the capacity to make it big and you have a capacity to make it little. Some people have minimized things that other people have been totally devastated by. So there is that capacity. And in the kingdom of God, what I love in the spiritual realm, big and little doesn't even exist on God's side. Big and little pretty much exists on our perspective, our worldview. But his is, and he stated it in the scriptures, is it easier for me to say your sins are forgiven or take up your bed and walk? We would see a distinctive difference, isn't it? He doesn't see a difference. Big and little does not exist. But the message today uh, is going to be, you pray for me, because this is my endeavor to help people. And we've seen thousands of people, literally from around the world, who have caught the simplicity that's in Jesus and have seen tremendous results uh, with self-deliverance, emotional healing, is as easy as breathing. And... And yet at the same time, uh, the ones that struggle, I want this to be the go-to message. I want you to get this CD if you're a people helper and they seem like they go, I don't get it. This will be the troubleshooting message for the, I don't get it. Because we've taught this to children from, what was the ones you taught Jennifer and saw results? Kindergarten? Five and six. Five and six year old. And so if they can do it, you can do it. And here is the, the, uh, <clears throat> the base structure. You know, if you form a theory on a false premise, <laughs> I don't care how good your theory is, if the premise is false, you got a problem. But the bottom line is, was it easy or hard to receive personal salvation? It was easy. You didn't agonize. It was a gift. And it was by grace through faith. It was saving faith and saving grace. And you opened, you receive forgiveness, and you walk. But Colossians 2.6 says, as you received him, remember it was easy, as you received him, walk likewise, or so walk. So then if you are struggling in your Christianity in the walk, I want to give you the enemy today. And this, this will apply to all of our phone coaches, um, this will apply to Jason on the online school where you have thousands of people with questions and results. We have discovered the enemy. It is, and this is worth writing down, the independent self. The independent self. It's the pitfall in your Christianity is to function as an independent self. We are participators as new creations, not spectators. And we'll, we'll cover some of that things. Um, but it's also 
in this replaced life, this born again experience, uh, you were joined to the Lord, you're one spirit with Him. When you function from your spirit, you function as a co-laborer. It's a we. You see somebody struggle in their Christianity and they're getting all bent out of shape, I promise you it's not a we, it's a me. The independent self. Uh, I can't do it. I, uh, that's a temper tantrum. The temper tantrum is always, always an independent self. What are the pretty much the standard answers that all of my pastors know and phone coaches and Jason, I'm sure, has been aware of it with online questions from the school is you're trying too hard. Was it hard to get saved? then it shouldn't be hard to walk it out. Real Christian living should be as easy as breathing, and emotional healing should be as easy as breathing. If it is not, the independent self is getting frustrated trying to do something you weren't meant to do. And there's usually two problems involved in that. One, <coughs> one it's like you get confused between what is my part and what is God's part. And there's almost always confusion there. I've had people even say, uh, well, if God is the forgiver, yeah, the reason we say God is the forgiver is because He is in you as the forgiver, and God, only God can forgive sin. Say that back to me. Only God can forgive sin. But then the Scripture says what to you? Unless you forgive. Okay, so the primary problem with people who are not being helped who have been Christians in many cases for years is making the distinction between who is you. Apart from Him, you can do nothing. Is that the independent self? That's what that's referring to. Your flesh. Apart from God, you can't do anything. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's not independent, that is co-laboring. When it comes from the heart, it's co-laboring unless you forgive from the heart. So who's doing the forgiving when you forgive from the heart? You and God. Because they that are born again are joined to the Lord, are one spirit with Him. So out of your belly flows. Out of your belly springs up eternal life. Out of your belly. It's where you are cooperating with God who is in you. So even to... Uh, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's, that's your part, right? Work out your salvation, but the very next verse says, For it is God who is at work in you to both will and to do. This is where they get confused. I've even had people say, who want to avoid pain at all costs. So they won't even momentarily give their hurt to God. They will say, Okay, if God's a forgiver, why don't God just go and forgive? And I can be detached from the relationship, that independent self. I can be alone and say, God, okay, God, you, you go do it. As a matter of fact, there's a heresy right now, currently, that's permeated the church that you never have to repent or forgive again because you did it once. So now you've got God doing what he did was so thorough that you don't ever have to participate. Or you're participating as a spectator rather than a participator. You're a participator. So uh, <clears throat> I want to start, and I want everyone that's uh, all of my pastors and people helpers, anyone that struggles, I want you to refer them to this CD. All right, we used to. Uh, <clears throat> all right, Galatians 2.20. This scripture basically shows how your life is joined to the Lord. When you got saved, you're not an independent self. Galatians 2.20 said, it is no longer I, it is no longer that independent I that lives. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, fused together. They that are joined to the Lord are one spirit. It's no longer me, it's a we. Okay? It's not just me. Me is the independent self. 
this life I'm living in the flesh, it's a we. Me and God joined together as a new creation, something that never existed before. Now, this suggests something. If it's no longer I who live an independent life, I am now fused together in this new creation, then it's no longer I who love. I've watched people try to love. You don't try to love. You love because he first loved you. You cannot love in and of your own strength. Human love is a beautiful thing to look at. Unsaved people love, but it's selfish. Even mother love, oh, this is where they throw cabbage and potatoes and stuff at me. All right, mother love is probably one of the most beautiful things in the world, that bonding between a mother and a child, particularly, knowing that she carried them in, their, in her womb. But even that is selfish. A person might give their life in a war for noble reasons, but would you give your son? That's different, isn't it? Would you give your baby? That's love. And no greater man has this kind of love than you lay down your life for your friends. Jesus was the son that was laid down. The father gave what he loved. Love releases, love frees. Love does not possess and own. Love does not control. And so if a person is going to understand the Christian life, there has to be, there has to be an understanding that it is no longer the independent life that rules. Oh, you'll go in and out of it, no doubt, in the process, but that's the work of the cross. That's the walking out of it. As you received him, Colossians 2.6 says, so walk likewise. Keep in mind how you received him. It was his ability, his grace, his empowerment. You didn't earn it through works, did you? Therefore, to work out your salvation is to learn to die to that independent life and allow Jesus to will and to do in you and through you. So, if a person, uh, you're trying to help somebody, and they go, I can't drop down, I don't know how to drop down. That's the temper tantrum of the independent self trying to do what any child could do. Now, do you have struggles? Sure, I know people do. Because primarily they're sincere, and that confuses the matter. You can be sincerely wrong <laughs> and get frustrated with it. But you're... God is basically saying, I'm, I'm, I'm fearful, really, that your mind has been corrupted with arguments and, and hostile evaluations that has corrupted you from the simplicity that's in Jesus the Messiah. As you received him, so walk the same way. And also we could call this message Forgive 123 because Jennifer, with all of her training, was trying to forgive somebody as a Christian and as a sincere Christian and a well-studied Christian was trying to forgive somebody for like a year or two. And I'm going, Jennifer, that's impossible. If you've been trying to forgive for a year or two, who's doing the forgiving? The independent self that was sincere. You can be sincere and sincerely wrong. And in a matter of seconds, I said, Jennifer, close your eyes. There's something beautiful that happens when you close your eyes. When you close your eyes, you have a tendency to get out of here a little bit, not much, but a little bit. You close your eyes. And it's just like swallowing food. You, you may not pay attention, but it goes down. When you close your eyes, you actually make a connection. No matter how subtle it might be, you make a connection. I said, close your eyes. Matter of fact, put your hand here because I want to get your focus to this part. I want this attention to be refocused on what's going on here. And she closed her eyes and I said, that's... That peace you feel is peace himself that is Jesus. And the Jesus in you, you and Jesus together, that's, that's your Jesus, that's your relationship. Nobody can have that relationship. You're a one of a kind. There never was another you. There never will be another you. That's the real you. Now, I know you can get back up in your head and forget momentarily the real you. But that's the real you. And practice makes permanent. And by reason of use, you get acclimated to that, we used to call it the bucket, 
the bucket going down. And there's actually scripture that refers to that. But <clears throat> if it's no longer I who live, but Christ in me, it's a we, right? I want to learn how to live out of that we. Because that's where the grace is. And grace is not just unmerited favor. Grace is empowerment or the ability to live the life. You live from the heart. Unless you forgive from the heart, it's not forgiveness. You will struggle with it no matter how sincere you are. So, if it's no longer I who live, then it's no longer I who love. Well, who's loving? Human love, you could be unsaved and love selfishly. But the love that God has is, is a love that dies to the independent self. So we, Scripture says we love because He first loved us. So in other words, if you haven't received that love, you can't love with that love. So if it's no longer I who live, it's no longer I who love. It has to be the new creation, the spirit that is joined with His spirit. This also suggests, and this has been the thing that really launched our ministry many years ago, that we saw the church needed so desperately, they didn't know how to forgive. Something as simple as forgiveness. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. It's no longer I who love, because unless I first received that love, I don't have the love to give, and it's a we. It's no longer I who forgive. And what does the Bible say in Matthew 18? Unless you forgive from the heart. The heart is the, is the source or the place where it is initiated properly as a co-laboring and where the grace or the empowerment to do it is. Ministry, uh, my spiritual father used to say, ministry is as easy as walking in the Shoney's. That was a restaurant at, in his day. I don't think there are any, are there? Are any of those around anymore? But he used to say, ministry is as easy as walking in the Shoney's. But he walked... He walked in a supernatural peace to where he trusted God more than he trusted his flesh. He functioned in union and communion with God more than he did trying. That's another thing. Um, we have uh, people that have, that have received a great deal of help uh, and they catch it like this and they go leaps and bounds. But every now and then we find someone who says, I don't get it. And in every case, the bottom line is it's the independent self that doesn't get it. So if you would even do this, I think this could help multitudes of people if they would see that your struggle is not with uh, uh, flesh and blood, but it's a spiritual battle, and the spiritual battle needs to be understood as a we and not a me. If you're angry, this doesn't work for me. You're having a temper tantrum from the independent self. And... So, I'm not a spectator, but a participator. If uh, I've been crucified with Messiah, it's no longer I who live, but Messiah lives in me. Galatians 2.20. If it's no, this life that I'm living in the flesh, I'm living by the faith of the Son of God. I'm living in union as a we. All right? That's what we would call the replaced life. But let me, let me show you how... Uh, by reason of use, you're going to have to get used to this because you're not going to get it as uh, to where it's automatic. Jennifer was like a uh, uh, a bucket, a yo-yo. She would go, "Oh, there it is. I feel this peace." And then she go, "But what about what about what about when I'm going to do this?" And I'm going, oh, "Okay, up there. You feel you feel like you went back to your head with analysis, which is paralysis." Now, do you feel that in that analysis, did you also feel that down here there's a lot of anxiety? Every thought has a corresponding emotion. This is the seat of the emotions. And probably the most profound thing that you need to understand is, and we've done this in churches, and it's a, it's a, it's a significant error. We would say, your will. Where's your will? And we're in churches of a thousand people or more, and 99% pointed here to the will. Wrong. This is your will. Your will is the door of the heart. And you have the ability to open it or close it. Have you ever been around someone you didn't want to be around? And down here, come on, be honest now. You didn't tell them, but down here you went like this. Hi. 
How many know what I'm talking about? You know what you just did? You put up a wall to that person. You didn't like their delivery, their style, their something. That wall is the independent self thinking that you protected yourself. When in reality, as a believer, the only thing that can protect you is the peace of God can guard your heart and your mind, but the peace of God is the opposite of a closed door. The peace of God is an open door. You go, oh no, you mean open to that horrible person? No, open to God. And it will guard your heart and your mind from that horrible person. Actually, you know what? You might even become a solution-oriented person. You might be able to, from that place of peace, feel what's coming from them and adjust accordingly. Like say hostility is coming from them, but they're smiling at you. All right? Discernment will bear witness. If you stay at peace, you'll feel the hostility regardless of the smile. You'll feel the source. Have you ever been complimented and you knew it was fake? This knew something that this didn't quite register. So you stayed at peace, but peace perceived that. And actually, if someone's really hostile, you know, the scripture says a soft answer turns away wrath. If you answer, I don't care if you say, oh my goodness, no matter what you say, if it comes from the place of peace, it has the love of heaven behind it. Oh, I'm so sorry you feel that way. I hate your guts. I'm so sorry you feel that way. If you could do that from the place of peace, and that takes practice, <laughs> you will eventually begin to see they are the victim, not poor you. They are the victim and they need Jesus. They need the peace that you have. They need the peace that guards your heart and your mind. And let's not make this complicated. The scripture says, let the peace of God rule. That means let Jesus be Lord. Because people go around quoting, oh, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord of my life, Jesus is Lord. No, not unless peace rules. He might be your Savior, but He's not Lord unless peace is ruling. So, now here's, here's one of the ways that the Lord taught me this. You know, um, <clears throat> when I was training Jennifer, we used this scripture in, in Proverbs 20, verse 5. Counsel in the heart of man is like water in a deep well, and a man of understanding draws it out. Understanding and mind in our scriptures in the Greek is N-O-U-S, nous. They knew the mind was not just your thoughts. Your mind was the entire mind, will, and emotions. That's why when you when you repent of something, it must be volitional, it must be of your will, it must be emotions to take the toxic emotions out of the way and you get your peace back, and the thought must become scriptural. You need mind, will, and emotions. That's your soulish nature, that's your carnal nature that needs to be transformed, not one, but all three. So understanding then is your mind, will, and emotions is infused with the mind of God. Isn't that nice? And then what do you have? No so. But your knower knows so. So it's like deep water. Now let me explain to you what, where the battle it begins for the individual. Now, each one is tempted. Anybody ever been tempted? <laughs> each one is tempted when he is drawn away drawn away. I want you to get a picture of what this looks like. Oh, we're going to have to do this by video uh, for some of the people on the school that have questions and stuff. Because in, <clears throat> in James chapter 1, verse 14, each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. You can operate with your five natural senses from the neck up. Sight, hearing, Taste, touch, smell, right? So what is temptation? Temptation works on your five senses to draw you away, right? You deserve a break today, McDonald's. You need to get away, all right? But when it says it's drawing you away, what's it drawing you away from? From the Lordship of Jesus and the rule over your flesh. So drawn away is like, 
your five senses our goal is to pull you away from God and get you into something else that independent self I want I want it and I want it now that's the way the flesh works so you're being drawn away so what do I do oh my goodness there's there's a there's QT and they got those donuts that I think there's drugs in them because they're so sweet. They're, oh, they're so good. I got to get a dozen. I don't know what they put in their sugar, but it's better than anybody else's sugar. And it's like, oh, I'm being drawn away. What, what does the scripture say? What do I do now? As you received him, so walk in him. I, I, I'm starting to function in the independent self. I want what I want and I want it now. And I'm drawn away. Everyone is drawn away by his five senses, by the lust of the eyes of flesh and the pride of life. I'm being, what does scripture say? Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. It's like gravity. It's, uh, Madame Guyon was a great mystic in the early centuries, and, and she said, it's like the law of central tendency, which would be like gravity. It means that if you return to God, grace is there to pull you back. You don't have to do it with self-effort. It's not the independent self. It's that I am returning to my union. I don't want to function independent. When I function independently, I always get in trouble. <laughs> I always do it and then go, oh, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have eaten a whole dozen donuts. I don't know. They were so good. No, but I I go, I to, and then how do you repent? Well, you better draw nigh to God. That's after the fact. The goal for the Christian life is to catch it before you do it, right? Nevertheless, you have a solution. Draw nigh to God. He will draw nigh to you. There's help for your will. All right. But you've got to know that your will is here and that it's the door of the heart. Now, <clears throat> draw nigh to God. He'll draw nigh to you. The replaced life is the life of Jesus in us as us either write it down or say it back to me G the life of jesus in us as us are we getting it okay we're getting rid of this independent self he's a troublemaker he wants to do what he wants to do when i was a young christian i felt my independent self was dennis the menace and i'm saying okay i got saved but dennis the menace rises up every now and then every now and then i want jesus to rule but every now and then i campaign for general manager of the universe. That's the independent self does that. You have to put a whip in your spirit's hand, so to speak, and get him to draw an eye to God. All right. So we were created in God's image. We're vessels. Uh, we need that self-life replaced, but we need self-effort replaced. Write that down. The self Life needs to be replaced, but self-effort needs to be replaced. Now, we're called to be vessels, containers of a spirit. And we, through the blood of Jesus and through his shed blood, we basically received the forgiveness of sin. We needed a new spirit. Now, in us, through us, I want to cover the grace of yielding. This seems to be a difficult part. If you look at all the old time hymns, it was I surrender all, I surrender, surrender, surrender. When we were in France, um, I, I said, we, I, we don't want to stuff our emotions. And the translator had the people, all of a sudden, everybody in the audience in France made funny faces. Because the word stuff was like you stuff a sausage. <laughs> and they were picturing what don't stuff sausages? I, I don't get what he said. But then we said, uh, how do you say it in French? Abandonne. Abandonne. Surrender. And the power of God flooded the room. Abandonne. Surrender. And when they yielded, or the grace of yielding, the presence of God came upon them. So there is an understanding that yielding is a grace. That you have the capacity to draw nigh to God and yield or surrender. Everyone that struggles with the simplicity that's in Jesus, in getting emotional healing, getting self-deliverance, whatever, if you're struggling with it, it is the independent self in some way, shape, or form. You're either wanting God to just go do it, you know, okay, I'll let Jesus forgive me. F 
for, I see everybody tries to catch that one because we say Jesus is the forgiver, but you are required to forgive. So that means both of you. But I like these people, uh, even on the, I'm sure you'll get it on coaching, uh, prayer coaching. By the way, if, if you're watching and you're thinking about calling one of our, our uh, phone coaches, they are a coach. And here's the typical wrong answer. I saw Dennis and Jennifer on Sid Roth one time. And then they call up and they go, ah! And they have all these issues. <laughs> At least get a superficial knowledge of the approach because they're not going to do to you anything. They're going to teach you, coach, that's why it's called coach, coach how to you to go to your Jesus and get free. <coughs> <coughs> That's terrible for some people. I don't want it that way. I want you to go like this to me and I'm better. Well, I would like that too. But so far, no one's ever done that for me. I have to go to Jesus. <laughs> what are you going to do? All right. So understanding the location of our will and how to yield is probably two of the most powerful lessons that you can ever learn. We even had people when we traveled that were so lost with how to yield, we would actually have them st uh, line up around the room and stand against the wall and fall backwards a little. Because falling backwards is unnatural. Your will does not want to fall backwards. You have to release your will to yield. Now, hopefully you don't have to fall to yield, all right? You learn to yield without falling, but interestingly enough, when I yield and kind of fall back, peace increases proportional to my yielding. Well, that's an interesting concept. What does that mean? How come when I yield, or even in simple lay terminology, relax, how come when I relax, I feel peace? How come when I'm tense, I feel frustration? Because tense down here is your white knuckling it. I can still remember a, a lawyer was madly in love with a woman in my church, and she didn't want nothing to do with him unless he came to church. And so he came to church, and he was white knuckling it in here, like, oh my God, how long is this going to take, and everything, and everything. And, but he was in love with that girl, and she wanted him to go to church, so he's going to look like this. And then, and then one day, he burst out crying, and he went, I tried not to listen. I tried not to listen, but he heard something, and God got his heart. And actually had a very, very remarkably good Christian life after that. <laughs> but I just thought that he was being honest. The independent self said, I'm going. I ain't listening. I'm going, but I don't trust them. I'm going. I even had a cop come one time. His whole family got saved, and they were so transformed it scared them for the better. So he came, and he went. And someone said, well, what'd you think? Because he was coming to scrutinize me. Because he was saying, I want to prove he's a cult leader or something, you know. Yeah, con artist. He said, this guy either really believes what he's saying or he's the best con artist I've ever seen. <laughs> you know what? That's the way your Christianity ought to be. huh? It ought to be convincing. Because the Holy Spirit convinces. Right? Now, yielding, understanding the location. This is the door of the heart. Now, you know, in the scripture says we have the power to bind and loose, okay? People usually don't get that right. But it simply means permit or forbid. So this is the door of the heart. Jesus didn't knock on your head. He knocked on the door of your heart and said, if I come in. So you either open the door or shut the door. And, you know, you'll understand a whole lot of scriptures that you didn't understand in the past, like hope. Hope is open. Hope means I don't know what's going on, but I believe love's going to come through. So I'm going to hold my heart open. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. That means you can shut down to everything around you, and you'll end up, it'll end up affecting your physical body. It's not healthy to shut down. And it's not healthy to put up a wall when you see people. 
As a believer, the only legitimate wall is peace, and it will guard your heart and your mind. That does not mean you open up to hostile people. That does not mean you don't establish boundaries at times. What it does mean, though, is that with the heart is open, peace will guard it, but peace will precede your perception. And you'll take the tinting off of your glasses and you will see them more clearly through the eyes of Jesus. You cannot have the eyes of Jesus if you don't have the heart of Jesus. You've got to wall up towards somebody. You don't have discernment. You're using body language, visual, opinions. <laughs> Scary, everybody's got opinions. Now, if we understand the location is in our gut, we can learn to yield and let Jesus, the forgiver, flow like a river. Now, <clears throat> here's the other thing we saw. We saw people who would want to get receive ministry and get a breakthrough in an emotional trauma area. And right now we've got a lady, and I hope she's watching this morning, because she's, uh, I think she had her conference October 3rd, and she's uh, recommending our material. She only deals with trauma believers, uh, some that have been freed from sex trafficking and others. And she's minute, she does a whole conference, and that's her primary audience. She's a trauma specialist. And... And uh, she says, four decades in the church. And she took our module one, four decades in the church, and I'm finally seeing where a whole lot of scriptures are making more sense as far as application. And, uh, and she's really excited, and I want to pray for her, because uh, I think she already had this last weekend, I think. I think yesterday she had her seminar. I don't know, but it's, uh, uh, that's, that's where my heart is. These people need to know that there's help. Uh, no offense, but Jennifer's mentor, I, w I don't want any, any religious people like that, really. She meant well, but she believed Jennifer was too far emotionally damaged to ever amount to anything because her theology was built on the experience of never seeing people helped. I was a baby Christian, and mental health was sending me people, and they were saying they were seeing positive results. Baby Christian. So I came from a entirely different <laughs> I just got a flash of what uh, Jason did one time when I had this guy who had been drinking uh, green beer and uh, he hated Christians but he came for counseling because uh, I didn't beat him up and he thought that was commendable and he was drinking green beer on St. Patrick's Day and he came to the house and he said, right, I guess it's Jason went oh this guy there's a guy at the front door with green lips and green tongue and <laughs> And he laid on the couch, and uh, it was so funny because he just laid on He says, you have no idea of the, how difficult my life is. And I'm going, Where? this guy came from my work, but he hated me, so I don't know what he's doing. And then all of a sudden, G.I. Joe. You know, I don't even know what G.I. Joe is. a little plastic figure about this big. All of a sudden, while I'm talking to him, G.I. Joe comes on a thread from the upstairs all the way past the couch. <laughs> Jason, Jason had G.I. Joe coming to entertain me in the process of ministering to people. So, I mean, this was ministry at the Clark's house, all right? Jason would be out playing with his little friend. He'd go, he'd come running, Dad, do you have an appointment? And I'd say, why? He went, well, there's this really strange guy walking back and forth in front of the house. <laughs> I figured you had an appointment. And sure enough, he was right. <laughs> so, I mean, don't tell me somebody's too difficult. I don't buy that. That's because the independent self really doesn't accomplish much in Christianity. But co-laboring with Jesus, learning how that it's no longer I who live, it's no longer I who forgive, it's no longer I who love, learning to stay in your spirit in communion with the Lord and all your frustration is an independent self crying out, I can't do it, I tried, it's too hard, all of that. All of that is a temper tantrum. And you either want Jesus to do something for you that he wants you to participate in, <laughs> or you're doing it on your own strength and getting mad. And you could say you're trying too hard and they still get mad. <laughs> I know you already told me that. That's still the independent self. 
wanting to do without God what only you and God can do together. And if kindergartners can do this, huh? I see little three-year-old, four, four-year-old, four, four-year-old going, we don't know what to do with her. We're beside herself. She won't go to bed without a light on. She's terrified. She has this tremendous fear. I prayed with her and I went, you have Jesus in your heart. And she goes, mm-hmm. I said, you have him in your heart? And she goes, mm-hmm. Jesus in my heart. And I says, he's not afraid of nothing. And you and him together are not afraid of anything. Together. She caught that. Four years old. Hmm. You don't have to leave the light on. I'm going to bed. Me and Jesus, because we're not afraid of nothing. <laughs> one, pr- one little prayer for the four-year-old. So if you're 44, <laughs> what's your excuse? The independent self. It's too hard. I try it. It doesn't work. I did your method, but it doesn't work. No. The independent self doesn't work. Apart from him, you can't do nothing. If it's not as easy as getting saved, there's too much of your flesh in the way. As you received him, so walk likewise. Exactly the way you got saved, that same amount of effort should be the way you forgive, should be the way you repent. The same amount you, here's the way it is, C-Y-O, we used to, Write this down in the classes for people. Consent. That's where it starts, but it doesn't end there. Consent. Okay, I'm going to do this. Yield or surrender. And then guess what? After you yield and surrender, and you maybe had a prayer coach, and you think you're done. No. Consent, surrender, obey. Faith without the corresponding action is dead. In other words, you have to act on That was my third topic. The replaced life and walking it out. We use the term walking it out, but it's really nothing more than faith without works is dead. You have to act on it. You need to practice, makes permanent. And you know what? You get better at it. How about this one? When I first got saved, I was uh, raised Catholic, and I found out that uh, you had to go to the confessional and confess your sin. I would go to the confessional, but uh, they gave you penance according to how bad your sins were. So I didn't tell them all. (laughs) And then I would get guilty after I left. Oh no, I didn't tell them all of them. So now I'm in worse shape, I need to go back. When When I got saved and found out, you can take your sin directly to Jesus. You don't have to go to the little box. I was, wow, that's easier. And then I found out, no, it's not. I have bad thoughts all day long. You mean I, I got to go to work. I can't be forgiving, my, forgiving people and forgiving myself and forgiving God all day long. I got to do other stuff. But fortunately, I knew it was the right thing to do and did it and was remarkable how the Holy Spirit works in you. Those periods became farther and farther apart. That's called sanctification. But all of a sudden, I realized God was doing a work in me, and he was changing my heart. And yes, I had to obey, though. I had to walk it out. I couldn't just give lip service to it. Now, it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to do it. That does not mean he's going to do it without you. We get calls like that all the time. I'm sure Jason would get it on the school, and I'm sure our phone counselors get it. I saw Dennis and Jennifer on Sid Roth one time. And I've got demons coming out of me all over the place. (laughs) Okay, you have to say, have you read any of the material? Do you have any understanding how they want to coach you to a place of health? No, I want it my way. My way is you just go like this, and I'm better. That's the independent self that wants someone else to do for them what you should be doing for yourself. Coaches mean you play the game, <laughs> we're going to give you some instruction. That's different, isn't it? I can remember one time I had an altar call, and the first lady that came up was a, just full of anxiety, and I, I said, here, put down here, the Jesus in you. We're going to take care of that anxiety. She goes, I want you to do it to me. I don't want to go to the Jesus in me. Isn't that kind of, she only said out loud what other people think and don't say. 
I want someone else to do for me what I need to do for myself. That's not discipleship, by the way. That's creating dependency. And that creates a, there's a, if I did it that way, then you've got to come back to me, Dennis, over and over and over again. And Jennifer's going like this. <laughs> right? Kill, let's kill the power. Oh, it would only take 10, 10 people who were, fix me, at the same time to drive anybody over the edge. Right? Unless you can keep your peace. <laughs> But the Bible says that we can know the God that is with us, Messiah in you. The kingdom of God is within you. What's the kingdom mean? It means he's king. What's a king do? He rules. So not theoretically, peace is the only indication he's really ruling. So you know where the door of the heart is. When we say drop down, by the way, you say, I never heard that in church. I've been in church 40 years and I never heard drop down. Drop down is in your Bible, technically. It's in the Greek, it's in duo. And it's in your, the English Bibles, it's put on. Put on bowels of mercy, put on the Lord Jesus, put on the new man, put on, put on. But it actually means to sink into in order to be clothed. It would be like immersing yourself in water. To be fully clothed with water, you sink into the element. You go down before it goes up. And you know that uh, it actually works that way. My favorite thing was when I told Jennifer, I start with the emotion every time because it's the nature that's attached to the words that's the problem. And, and she saw that, for example, if we're standing in a, out in a hallway and suddenly there was a crash, a loud crash, your whole body would jump Molecules of emotion would cascade through your entire body before this thing even knew what happened. So you, you've got to understand emocognition, emovolition. The emotions control your choices. The emotions control your thoughts. And you can override that temporarily, but emotions don't die. They get buried alive. And they're like little time bombs, but they don't blow up once. It's not like a minefield. Blow up once, they're done. No, no, these can... You can have anything you haven't dealt with, have someone push that button every now and then, and ah, out comes this person. <laughs> and you can hide it for a long time. We had a lady that was like a remarkable Christian. Oh, I mean, you thought she was a martyr. And she, she basically hid behind this unsavory man who is unsaved and I have to live with him. And oh, the pain that I live, I'm such a martyr. And then the man gets saved, and gloriously saved, and everybody's looking at him. I was like, this guy practically glows. She went, Yay! all of a sudden she turned into this evil person. That was the stuff that was always in there, but she hid behind the fact that I'm in this abusive situation with this unsaved husband. You know what you would do, then you would never deal with your stuff. That's the independent self. All right, now I want, to, I want to give it this. Our website is called Forgive123, and that came from my genius wife. She said, this is as easy as 123. And if I've got to teach people this, it's not going to be complicated. It's as easy as 123. 80% of emotional healing, 80% for the believer. If you're not a believer, this doesn't work, by the way, because Jesus takes the pain and the sorrow. I always have people that'll call up and say, well, this work with unsaved people? No. It's called Jesus. Jesus would work with unsaved people if they got saved. Uh, anyway, I, I get weary of that one. 40 years of answering that question. If Jennifer had to teach this to some ladies and she was going to a retreat, she just said, one, two, three. First, feel, forgive. 80% of the people could be helped if you could just show them how to do one, two, three. The first person or situation that comes in your mind, oh, that's my ex-boyfriend, that's my ex-girlfriend. Oh, what's the feeling? Oh, yuck. Some people can't even define what it is, but it's not peace. <laughs> oh, my ex-boyfriend, my ex-girlfriend, yuck, yuck. Then. Why not do what's Bible, and that is let the forgiver in you. Now remember, the forgiver in you is you too. 
You have to forgive. Why don't you forgive right through that yuck to where up here, I picture my ex-boyfriend or girlfriend, whatever the case may be, I picture them and when I forgave from my heart, it changed to peace. Isn't that interesting? And not only did it change to peace, but love precedes peace. There's actually a river of loving intercession going out to that person that you don't want to be your ex-boyfriend. You don't want them to be your ex-girlfriend. You don't want them to be current in your life. But you have peace. So you see, walking it out now might, might require uh, establishing boundaries. Uh, it may, may involve a lot of other things in the natural, but the primary purpose that there is a supernatural, this is the word, you got to write it down. And if you're watching by Ustream and uh, you're, you're struggling with, I can't do it, I don't know how. Peace is the internal indication, it's proof of a transaction has taken place. If I see someone in here, creates a yuck, ugly feeling here, and I release forgiveness. If it didn't change the peace, I didn't do it. The independent self tried to do it. Or the independent self went, well, let, let Jesus go do it. <laughs> He's the forgiver. Let him go do it. Well, he did 2,000 years ago. Now he wants you to join him because he's the only one that can forgive, but yet he's asked you to forgive. So you're going to have to do it with him from the heart. Huh? And how do I know if I did it? You don't have to call someone and say, I don't know if I did it or not. Yes, you do. Did it change the peace? Can you picture that person without the ugly feeling? If you picture the person, you still got the ugly feeling. No, you didn't do it. The independent self found a way to avoid pain. The independent self will do everything to avoid pain. And it even prides itself that I can't do this like other people. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. What they're saying is, I have a standard higher than the cross. You see, I'm a complicated person. I can remember having a, a guy who struggled with his sexual identity, and he was trying to tell me, you don't understand, nobody can minister to me because I'm a complicated person. I said, well, good, because if you can accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it's, it just got simple. Pride is rooted in Satan. Humility is rooted in God. Let's go for humble. I, I like being complicated. I like being more difficult than other people. That might work for some people, but not me. There's the pride of inferiority and there's the pride of superiority, but pride is pride. It's the wrong tree. There's two trees in the garden, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And there's too much that people see as good that's not God. Hmm? And besides, actually, throw this part in there. Isn't that really socialism? It has to have something good and appealing. It's not going to be blatant evil. It will lead to communism. It's always uh, all the greats, Marx, all of them said that socialism is just the getting the camel's nose into the tent for communism. And, <clears throat> of course, nowadays, young people believe communism is a good thing. Uh, they haven't studied the history, nor the facts. They haven't read Jennifer's book. <laughs> but, uh, and we've just updated for the younger generation, because they wouldn't be familiar with a lot of the examples, but they would be familiar with Korea, China, and other places like that. Yeah, the original book is at the back table there. It was, was Jesus a capitalist, but it's been updated and expanded to Satan is a socialist. <laughs> so either side of the coin. First, feel forgive. Everybody know how to do that. You phone coaches, when you get somebody and they go, I saw Dennis and Jennifer and Sid Roth and I, I got demons coming and I have this leopard that jumps out of my closet and I... Uh, you have to get them to first feel or forgive or you will not make progress. And actually, we're going to put that on the web eventually. We're going to get that on the web. Please 
research some of the material before you call for a phone coaching appointment. <laughs> it would be very helpful because otherwise you waste that half hour being instructed that it's going to be the Jesus in you that's going to do the work if you'll cooperate and we can show you how. And it can be very, very beneficial. But we're not going to do it to you and for you. Now, first feel forgive. And I'm going to close with this. This is the most important part. If in doubt, in over 40 years, I've dealt with rape victims and people that were uh, sexually molested. And I saw tremendous healing in a very short period of time. But the, I found that almost without exception, they had to forgive in three directions. So if you're a note taker, write that down. Three directions. Say, say uh, a young girl is walking through the park alone and she got raped and traumatized. And she's a believer, so she, she can go to Jesus. But the trauma has to be brought, first of all, and this is when you say the Jesus in you does the forgiving, does that make it a little more plausible? If you are a rape victim and you had a perpetrator, say, you need to forgive that perpetrator. You're up here it goes till, 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 right? But if you say, the only one capable of that kind of forgiveness is the God in you. Let Jesus the forgiver, you and the forgiver, you cooperate with it, you still got to do your part, but when you cooperate, the grace will be there. The grace to take away the pain and the trauma. So you forgive the perpetrator, but invariably, I've rarely seen an exception to this, they even uh, as they pray to release they saw that that person is really needy. That person desperately needy saved. There's something seriously wrong with that individual. And I'm letting Jesus take my pain and my trauma. However, after I release forgiveness to the perpetrator, and that's usually the hardest one, I have to forgive myself because they will have a tendency to beat themselves. Why did I go out by myself? Why didn't I should have known better than to go through the park at night? I should have, I should have, they have to receive, it's like drinking in, receive forgiveness for themselves because they'll walk in incrimination, they'll feel like second class, they'll have this distorted image of who they are. You're not tainted goods, you are clean and made clean and only the blood of Jesus can make you feel that clean. And I said, feel that clean as well as think that clean. You can't think clean if you don't feel clean, right? It'll argue against each other. That's why you need a supernatural transaction. But then, and this isn't always, but most of the time, the sovereignty of God gets confused here and they have to release the judgment. Why did God let that happen? So, but I found out that for people to get totally free, you can't be mad at God and expect to get results. It happened. And you need to release that judgment you had against God. God didn't do nothing wrong, but when I say forgive God, I really mean release that judgment that you had that He didn't intervene like you thought He should, which is a little arrogant. You know, bad things happen to good people. And your response is for you to be clean and whole and move forward. And quite frankly, when you forgive the perpetrator and you feel peace, you receive forgiveness and feel peace, you release any judgment against God and feel peace, you are an anointed candidate to help people in the same situation. Didn't we, where, where did we go to? Bruce Wilkinson, the guy that did the Jabez prayer. Jennifer and I went and counseled with 250 crisis um, pregnancy centers, okay? Of the 250, the vast majority had had an abortion. So being an activist is good, but there's something better than being an activist, and that's making sure that you can give spiritual help to them. And if you're clean and you're free, you can then in turn say, you know, because what people say, you don't understand. Oh, that's, that's a good one for the phone coaches and the online school. You don't understand what I've been through. You, you'll never win that one with people. They're, they're, 
they're bathing in the you don't understand what I've been through. Like theirs is always the worst. Turn it to Jesus and say, fortunately, we have a solution. You don't say, Jesus doesn't understand what I went through. And they won't argue with that. If you want to help people, use that illustration. Don't get in a tit for tat. Well, I was, I had this happen. I, don't compare apples with oranges. If someone says, you don't understand what I have, but Jesus does. Let's go to him because it, therein lies the solution for a supernatural transaction to take place in your life and for you to be well. And when God causes a transaction or a supernatural exchange to take place, that peace will last you the rest of your life. Matter of fact, we used to challenge people, say, uh, say you were a rape victim and you did the three ways and you knew you got peace on it. Five years later, close your eyes. It's not a pleasant thing to think about, but think about the time you were in the park and that happened. The peace will still be there. Is that worth momentary pain? Is that worth facing something, your trauma, momentarily? And by the way, always use the word momentarily. People will face pain momentarily if they know they can be free. Otherwise, you're asking them to do something that's abusive. And that's the way they'll hear it at first. But say, are you willing to be willing? John 7:17 7, says, if anyone will do my will, he shall know. You want the, that kind of knowledge? God isn't going to give you the knowledge first. God's going to say, first you be willing. You be willing and God will come through. Forgive, one, two, three. First, feel, forgive. 80 to 90% of emotional healing is done there. There's other steps involved in other situations, but just think how many people you could help if you helped 80% of the people with one, two, three. It's as easy as forgive, one, two, three. First, feel, forgive. That's our website, so you can remember that, right? Now, Jennifer, with all her training, boiled it down and said, I put all my training on a shelf because in Jesus, it's one, two, three. But you do have to walk it out. Like teaching Jennifer to stay dropped down was a process. She learned to get emotional healing. Her prior mentor said, what happened to you in a matter of uh, less than 60 days? What happened to you? You are changed. I've known you for years, but you're changed. What happened? It was one, two, three. But if she was in the car and thinking, and all of a sudden the car felt like a chihuahua on caffeine, I'd say, Jennifer, what are you thinking? She'd go, I just want to let me go to the supermarket and this is going to get the car and I'm going to have to move all the furniture. And I'm going, that's exactly what you're putting in the atmosphere. Drop down, and she would go back down to her spirit, and the car would fill with peace again. So you can fool people with your words, you can fool them with your gestures, but you can't hide what emanates. I can, I can feel a uh, hyper chihuahua. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. It's not like it's going to bite your leg off. I can feel one of those a mile away. And basically, in order to help people, you're not really going to feel what's going on until you're at peace. All right? All right. Hope this helps. This should be the go-to message. All right? This is basic for my church people, but it's also troubleshooting to truly help other people. It's location, location, location. And what are the three titles for this message? <laughs> the pitfalls of the independent spirit. The replaced life and walk it out. And forgive, one, two, three. That's all you need to know, and you'll be fine. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.